What is up, my exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in into another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior List Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Julie Mitchell. Hey, Julie, how you doing? Hey, Chief. It's great to see you. Awesome, awesome. And we got a special guest co-host today, um, my brother from uh, the my brother in arms from the uh, he's a senior listed advisor for the exchange out there in the Pacific region, Sergeant Major Wayne Crudup. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Good afternoon. Good morning. All uh, that. <laughs> all that. What time we What time we got you over there in uh, Okinawa? It is zero three in the morning. Zero three, man. Look at that. He. He going to sacrifice just to be on the Chiefs chat, man. That's what's up, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Hey, this is number one uh, podcast in, in America right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, but we, we we do have a big game this weekend now. It's uh, Army versus Air Force. And, and, and you know what? With, with the Navy, the Navy kind of slept on us last time, and we ran the score up on them, so. So this is Army. We don't do that. We're not worried about you guys. <laughs> Go Army, be, be, be the Air Force all, all day. Right. Let's go Falcons. Okay, but but we're going to transition into our guest today, man. I'm super excited about our next guest uh, because it's not every day you get to sit down and talk to a real life American hero. But guess what? We're doing that just today. Uh, without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Thanks, Chief Osby, and welcome, Sergeant Major Crudup. It's always good to see you. This is a special Chief Chat episode, part of our In Recognition of series. As Veterans Day approaches, we're honored to salute our nation's heroes like today's guest, our friends at the Navy Exchange, Marine Corps Exchange, Coast Guard Exchange, and Defense Commissary Agency will be helping us host episodes of the special series all month long. Today's guest is a Vietnam War hero. His service in the Army included two tours to Vietnam. He was awarded the Medal of Honor after risking his life to single-handedly save 14 others after being attacked by the Viet Cong. He also earned two silver stars, three bronze star medals, and two purple hearts for his service in the war. It is our distinct privilege to have him as our guest today. Please help us welcome Colonel Retired Jack Jacobs. Hey, thanks. Nice. Good to be with you. Thank you, sir. And for all of those watching, drop us a note in the comments. And let us know where you're watching from. Send, share some love with Colonel Jacobs in the comments. Leave your questions for him too, and we will. Now is a fantastic time to start your watch party and enjoy this live interview with your friends. If you're not already following our page, you should. We have great chief chat in recognition of guests coming up all month long. Oh, Colonel Jacobs, man, it is truly, truly an honor to have you with us today. You're, you're a highly, highly decorated service member, uh, it, and we thank you for your sacrifice and your service. Uh, all the folks at the exchanges across the board uh, and the commissary as well appreciate you for your uh, service and your dedication to our great nation. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Well, thanks for having, having me on the program. I'm, I've, I've been looking forward to it for quite some time. Hold on just a second. I apologize for this. Oh, no worries. Got to get rid of those pesky, <laughs> pesky people. I'd rather be with you than anybody else in any case. So I, I seriously, I've been, I've been looking forward to this for some time. Same here. Awesome. Uh, sir, I echo Chief Osby sentiment. Uh, great to have you with us today. Where are you joining us from and um, how have you been faring during this pandemic? Well, I'm in New Jersey uh, where I started out. I, uh, I came into the Army when I was graduated from college in New Jersey. And then when I retired, I came back to New Jersey because I got a job offer from a guy whose business was here. And, uh, and so I've been here on and off for a long, long time. Um, it's it, For somebody who's been around people his whole life you know when you're in the service you're around people everything depends on the people around you and they depend on you and to be isolated like this is very very uncomfortable I I always feel better when I'm around people who uh, have been in uniform or are in uniform and I don't get much of that locked up here in my house in New Jersey so this is a great treat for me Awesome. Well, we're, we're happy to kind of feel that extrovert need that you have. <laughs> of Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yes, we got you, sir. 
So, sir, we would like to start off by asking you what led you to the Army and what led you to answer that call to serve? Well, two things. The first is that my father uh, was in the Army, had been drafted into the Army during the Second World War, and he fought in New Guinea and the Philippines in the South Pacific. Uh, he hated the Army, uh, hated getting dragged out of school, uh, hated getting shot at. Nobody likes that. Hated the bureaucracy got out the instant he possibly could at the end of the war. And then when he got to be my age, all he would talk about was how proud he was at having saved the world. And all of his friends too, the, the same. They're all, they hated it and hated it and it's no good and bad news. And, and then when they grew up, they realized <laughs> that, that defending the country was something that they were, that was the thing they were most proud of. And the second thing is, and it's related to that, was that I thought then uh, when I came into the army, and I still think today that everybody who's lucky enough to live in a free country owes it something in the form of service. People join a service and go in a uniform for a wide variety of reasons. Sometimes they do it for multiple reasons. I got nothing to do and that's what I wanna do. I wanna be part of something bigger than, oh, I need the money. Whatever the reason is at the end of the day, they are part, all of us are part of something bigger than ourselves. And if you want to feel good about yourself and about your country, that's the way to do it is to, is to make a contribution to the defense of the Republic. So my hat is, is off to everybody who's in uniform now. We've got a relatively small number of people who are out there defending, what, 330 million of us? Well, I, uh, I always wanted to be and still am proud that I was part of an organization like that. That's awesome. Awesome. So awesome. Uh, I understand that uh, as a young soldier, you wanted to go to Vietnam and you wanted to fight. Can you tell us some more about that? Well, you know, you got, if you want to be in it, you may as well be in it. You know? <laughs> but, I was, right? but, but I was going anyway. It didn't matter whether I wanted to or not. That was going. But there, I was... I, I, I had a wife and two children. My first assignment when I, uh, when I came into the Army was in the 82nd Airborne Division. I was in Charlie Company, second of the 505th Airborne. And uh, back in those days, I was making $220 a month with a wife and two kids. And uh, you got 110 a month for jumping out of airplanes. You don't have to be a CPA to do the math. Uh, that's a 50% increase in salary <laughs> just for jumping out of airplanes. And you don't have to do anything. Gravity does all the work, you know. Well, <laughs> if you went if you went to Vietnam, you went into combat, you got a dollar a day family separation allowance and uh, $65 a month combat pay. That's almost, that's very nearly 25 bucks extra a week. Uh, sign me up for that. So <laughs> I was highly motivated because I needed the money, but I, but mostly I was a soldier and the place for me was where where we were fighting and that's why I went to Vietnam principally. Awesome, sir. Um, let's talk about March 9th, 1968, the date that actually took place for which you received the Medal of Honor. What can you share with our viewers about the, about the battle and your heroic efforts? Well, I don't know, there, was, there were plenty of heroes on that day. Well, uh, the short end of the story is that we had been in contact with an enemy battalion for the duration of the Tet Offensive in 68. And um, then the enemy broke contact. Uh, higher headquarters figured out they knew where the enemy had gone to. And three days later, we mounted an operation. Uh, my battalion uh, landed on the north side of the Mekong River and headed north. Uh, a ranger battalion was inserted by helicopters uh, to the east and then moved to the west perpendicular to our line of movement and we were gonna converge on where the headquarters thought the bad guys were. And uh, at, we landed at dawn at about by 10 o'clock in the morning, we had run into an enormous L-shaped ambush. And I found out later on that the enemy had had spies in the province chief's headquarters. So they knew exactly, they know our, our whole op plan. And on top of that, we should have had scouts out to the front and to the flanks. And for one reason or another, they weren't. 
And to this day, I can't tell you where they were, but I can tell you where they weren't. They weren't to the front and to the flanks because the first guys the enemy encountered uh, were me and Staff Sergeant Ray Ramirez and the two companies we were with and we walked into a huge ambush. Uh, they let us get within about 50 meters of their position and uh, there were more than 200 of them. And we lost a lot of guys killed and wounded in the first 10 seconds of the engagement. Um, in the end, uh, we prevailed and we prevailed because there were a lot of brave people on the battlefield that day, but we lost a lot of, uh, lost a lot of soldiers, um, both killed and wounded. And, uh, and, and it was a, from that standpoint, it was a very sad day. I managed to make it out alive, uh, but only just. Yeah, to kind of put that in perspective uh, for our listeners, uh, you were 23 years old when this happened. And so I'm just thinking back to myself as a 23 year old and not and, and not having uh, like the mental fortitude. But I guess if, if you're put in, in a situation where you have to uh, fight or flight, then that kind of kicks in. So can you just can you just kind of tell us what went through your mind as a young man uh, when all this stuff was going on and what kind of kept you going? Well, it's an interesting question, Chief, because it talks a lot about, I know I'm preaching to the converted because everybody listening is, uh, is in uniform or has been in uniform. Uh, when, you, when you're with a bunch of people, uh, who, they depend on you and you depend on them. Um, there, there, there's a Medal of Honor recipient now deceased named Nikki Bacon from, uh, from the war in Vietnam, who says that... Uh, who said at the time he didn't, didn't wear the medal for himself. He wore it for all those who can't. Uh, we were all in it together. And my perception was, now I had a bad head wound, uh, but my perception was that uh, I was the only guy who could do anything. And if, and if somebody didn't do something, I mean, this is a genuine crisis situation, then we were, nobody was going to make it out and we would not prevail against the enemy. Um, there's an old, uh, first century Hebrew scholar who said it really well, uh, Hillel, who said, if not you, who? And if not now, when? Uh, other Medal of Honor recipients, and not just Medal of Honor recipients, but anybody who spent any time in combat will tell you the same thing. I, whatever I did, uh, I did at least partially because if the situation were reversed, uh, my buddies would do it for me. I mean, yeah, it was Ben. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who, just before the revolution, either wrote or said, uh, "We either hang together or we will surely hang separately." Um, that's something you learn as a young soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, and it never leaves you. Yeah. Now they they embody they beat the team aspect of you know watching my six or or just whatever your job is. You, you're part of a team and, and everybody on that team depends on each other to be successful. And so uh, whether you're in combat or you're freaking in finance, like there, there's, there's just, <laughs> there's correlations to, to this team construct that, that we, we just embody in the military. And, and I love it. Absolutely love it. So sir, you received the medal of honor on October 9th, 1969 from president Nixon. What do you remember about that day and that ceremony? Well, it's an interesting question. I, there, I don't remember much about the ceremony, actually. <laughs> um, and, and, I, I, and I'll tell you why. So we were in the, there were four of us from the Army who were getting decorated in the same ceremony, but for different actions. And so we were, we were in the Oval Office, and then we were in the East Room with, um, with guests and families uh, drinking bad coffee and eating stale donuts <laughs> and all that. Um, <laughs> And then we moved out to the, to the Rose Garden where the ceremony was to take place. And the thing I remember most about the ceremony was coming out of the White House and marching up onto the platform where we were located. There was the President, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of uh, the Army, uh, the President's Army aide, uh, Colonel Coffey, and we mounted the podium and the thing that struck me then and still strikes me today was the sea of people in, in front of us. It was a glorious day uh, in October, sunny and all that. And they had, 
opened up the White House grounds to anybody who wanted to come and see the ceremony. They gave the government off so they could come in. To, uh, passers by, homeless people, well, anybody could come onto the White House grounds and watch the ceremony. Wow. And that's, a, I mean, things wow. have changed now. You can't yeah. go anywhere near. Yeah. Exactly. So, but back in those, you could. I mean, and, and that's what struck me the most, the sea, there were people as far as you could see uh, and the sea of people and that stuck in my mind to the, to, till today. And that's the thing I remember most about the ceremony. I love that. That must have meant so much to you. It's just to see a sea of people wall to wall um, out the gates. I, I love that okay, that I'll happened you for another, you. I'll, I'll tell you another anecdote related to that. We're in the, in the, uh, the Oval Office and President Nixon says to me, he says, uh, are you nervous, son? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. He said, well, I am. And he, had the, <laughs> he had the Nixon beat a sweat on his upper lip. And <laughs> That's a trip. <laughs> Absolutely true. Wow, sir. Um, that's amazing. So after you received the Medal of Honor, um, how did life change for you? You, even, you continue to serve in the military and the Army, and then even back to Vietnam, Vietnam, correct? Yeah, Sergeant Major. So uh, let me tell you a story about that that relates to that and relates to the whole notion of being in uniform. The, uh, uh, we, we used to, Medal of Honor recipients used to get together every other year. There were almost 400 living recipients when I was decorated. There was still a living recipient from the Boxer Rebellion, a guy named Bill Seach, who conducted a bayonet charge on the Citadel in Beijing in 1900. He was still alive. There were a bunch of World War I recipients and so on. So I was at a dinner one time shortly after I was decorated, and there must have been 350 Medal of Honor recipients there. Uh, of course, there are only 69 of us left now. Um, and when the dinner was over, Jimmy Doolittle came over to me. And if you don't know who Jimmy Doolittle was, you got to look it up. Uh, he conducted the, Doolittle, right, right. The, uh, the raid on Tokyo in early 42 to demonstrate to the Japanese that we were coming back. And it was a one-way suicide mission, you know. Anyway, he, was, uh, he had received the Medal of Honor as a lieutenant colonel for leading this when I saw him, he was a retired three-star general, right? So here's Jimmy, I mean, Jimmy Doolittle, a household name, World War II hero, and so on. He comes up to me at the end of the dinner, puts his arm around my shoulder, takes me into the corner of the ballroom, and he says, young man, let me tell you something. You're no longer Jack Jacobs. You're Jack Jacobs Medal of Honor recipient, and you better act accordingly. Do you understand what I'm telling you, young man? I said, yes, sir, I sure do. <laughs> you know? so, so to say that my life has changed is, um, is an understatement. I realized, like Nikki Bacon said, that I don't wear it for myself. I wear it for all those who can't. Um, yes. And I represent everybody in uniform. Think about all the people who fought in combat in the last 245 years in this country and, and who performed valiantly on the battlefield and nobody saw it. Or how about if people saw it and they themselves were killed, there were no witnesses. Or as has happened many, many times, they wrote it all up, but either accidentally or in some cases on purpose, the paperwork was lost. Um, and you realize that you, you, your life changes because you're not, you're not you anymore. You represent all those brave young men and women mm. who defended the country then and are still defending it today. Awesome, sir. That, that's amazing. So you, you touched on this, uh, this phrase, uh, this uh, proverb, uh, if not now, when? And I know that's the name to the title of your memoir, uh, but what does that phrase mean to you? You know, we sometimes overuse the term crisis. You know, if you're working for somebody, as I have from time to time, uh, especially since I got out of the service, um, I, I was in the banking business and done a lot of other things since then. But you work for people who says that everything's a crisis. Every time you see this person, he says, hey, what, you, you got, this is a crisis. Well, listen, if, this, if everything's a crisis, then nothing's a crisis. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think one of the, one of the, the, the characteristics of a really good leader is the capability to distinguish between situations that are real crises 
and situations that are just lousy. I mean, there's a big difference between the two because if you start throwing your resources out when it's not a crisis, when there is a crisis, you're not gonna have any resources left. Right. So you gotta be very, very careful about what, a crisis is a very particular kind of thing. Things are really bad, they're getting worse, something's gotta be done, it's gotta be done right now, and if it's not done right now, everything's going down the tubes. There are very few situations that are like that, but I think you can identify them when you're yeah. in the middle of them, yeah. and most of those occur, in my experience, all of them like that have occurred in combat. Uh, it, you you got to be able to say to yourself, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, this is bad news and it really doesn't matter uh, what, what really matters are my buddies. And, and, and I think that's what motivates people to do the right thing when the time comes. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. So, sir. Um, what do you want today's men and women in uniform to know about a life of service? Well, I, that's an interesting question, too. You know, when I came in the Army, we had a draft. Uh, you, we had lots of people who were dragoon, kicking and screaming into the service in Vietnam. And yet, I'm telling you, their reaction today when they're 70 to 80 years old is just like my father's reaction when he was the same age about his service. I'm very, they're all very... Pr even though they were dragged into the service, they're very proud of having served. Now we've decided to basically outsource the defense of the Republic to a very small uh, number of young men and women who are willing to defend the other 330 million of us. And I think people in uniform now who are standing watch for whom it's 3.30 in the morning, uh, <laughs> you know, wherever they are, know that there are people, two things. First of all, that there are people who love them and know what they're doing for all of us. And second, even if they didn't, don't say thank you. You know, most Americans don't know anybody in uniform. Even if they don't ever encounter you, uh, you're, you're doing something that will uh, stand the test of the ages. You're, doing, you're keeping us free and you're keeping faith with the 20 million people who came before you in uniform, many of whom didn't come home, uh, you're keeping faith with them by doing what you're doing. Man, that's, awesome. that is, that's, a, that's great, great advice. Um, and, you know, me being here at the exchange, I, 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 this is a primarily civilian organization, but it's a part, part of the Department of Defense. But uh, it's, I'm so amazed by the civilians that are willing to serve our service members because our, our exchange associates, they deploy and they go down range and they, they want to make sure that, uh, that, they, that the service member gets a little piece of home no, no matter where they go. So Yeah, uh, most people don't realize that. For every service member, there's a family of a service member. There's, there are civilians who support them. Uh, we forget that sometimes, and you're absolutely right. we got to remember that. Absolutely. So I just wanted to know if you wanted to give some words to all the Americans uh, that, that to – all Americans to know about serving others and protecting freedoms. Because you, you, you made a good point. You feel like everybody in a free country should, should serve in some form or capacity. Yeah, I, you're looking at somebody who believes in universal service. So yeah. it, we don't have time to talk about all that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we have, we, we have the political will to do that, but I, but I, I think you gotta be motivated enough about freedom to, to to maintain it and serve it. But all that notwithstanding, I, I was, I can't remember when it was, I was getting interviewed by somebody either on television or for a newspaper and asked me in conjunction with the, the Medal of Honor and all the rest of that stuff, uh, was that the proudest thing I'd ever done? And I said, no, no, the proud, I am most proud of just having worn the uniform. That's the thing I'm most proud about, I'm proudest about. Uh, and uh, I believe that when I put the uniform on and I'm gonna believe it till the day I die. So sir, we would love to know what, after your, you were had a great army career, a more than great army career, you, what are you doing now? Uh, what's, how do you spend your time? Where, what's, what's life like for you now? 
Well, I mean, it's very fragmented. So I came out of the army. I, I, I worked on Wall Street. A guy who had been in the Marines uh, had his own company on Wall Street and came up to me at a at a party one time and said, you know, you ought to retire from the army, come to work for me and, and I'll pay you to learn the bond business. When I got home, my wife asked me about the party and and I told her and she said, what's the bond business? I said, I have no idea whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason the guy hired me is because he'd been in the Marines and he knew what veterans are capable of doing. Most veterans themselves don't realize that they've had more authority and responsibility at an early age than the people who are even thinking about hiring them. And think, think about an aircraft carrier, for example. I did a package for NBC Nightly News a couple of years ago and shot it above the aircraft on an aircraft carrier. And my pitch was, you've got $80 trillion worth of equipment run by 19, 20 year old kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, where in civilian life are you going to get that kind of authority and responsibility? <laughs> um, so uh, that's the thing. Thinking about that motivates me and gives me, uh, it gives me a great deal of optimism about the future. If, if we're going to be able to rely on the people who are in uniform, uh, then we're going to be in pretty good shape indeed. Um, I, I'm sorry to digress, but I wanted to get that in. I, <laughs> No, you're good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy where, where we're going. Did we get, and get, as these young people mature and take on more and more responsibility, uh, we're going to be in good hands. The other thing I'm, I'm, you know, I'm involved in a lot of charities. I help mm -hmm. to raise money for the Children of Fallen Patriots Foundation, which raises money to send to college uh, kids of uh, people who are KIA. Um, I'm involved in some, I'm on the board of the USO in New York. Um, and uh, I do some television for my sins from time to time. And I teach, I teach, uh, I, I teach at West Point. I teach cadets uh, money and banking and mass media and American po uh, politics. Although I do it, you know, virtually, which is very frustrating, I think for everybody. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, but it keeps, it, it keeps my, to the extent that I've got, I've still got some brain cells operating. It keeps them, keeps them operating, keeps them working. So I, I, I stay busy. I do a lot of charitable stuff and it makes me feel good. Well, it's, it's funny that you say that you walked from a party and said, I have no idea about bonds whatsoever. And now you're teaching it to West Point. <laughs> well, and I never took an economics course. And what this guy knew, because like I said, he'd been in service, he'd been in the service. He knew that if you got a service member, if you got somebody who was a veteran, it didn't matter whether he knew something about it or not. You gave him a mission. He was going to get it done. Veteran, he was going to find out how to do it, man. Yeah, absolutely. And was going to get it done. Uh, and more efficiently than anybody else. I mean, I talk, no offense, because there were no civilians who were not associated with the military here, but you, I encountered plenty of civilians who never wore the uniform, had nothing to do with the military, not a service member's family or anything like that. And you, you got to, you got to explain to them everything from A to Z in minute detail. You talk to a service member, for, former service member, and you say, I know you don't know anything about this, but here it is. He or she will figure it out, man. Yeah. He'll get it done. He'll get it done. <laughs> So, sir, I wanted to share some comments that are coming in on our live Facebook feed. Mark Terry from New Hampshire said he's a lieutenant colonel retired. He said, former LT who served with Colonel Jacobs, great leader and battalion commander who taught me so much. So you have a, a fan out there in him. Well, tell him he, he must, he's got to be old. He's going back to like 1980. <laughs> <laughs> he's old. So, well, you, you heard it there. Um, and then Scott Maskery, Colonel Maskery is our senior enlisted advisor. Uh, I'm sorry, he is the commander of our Pacific region for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Colonel Maskery says, Colonel Jacobs, thank you for your service. And thank you for stopping by the Air Force's Squadron Officer School at Maxwell Air Force Base in May, June of 1997. 
said you spoke to our class about your experience and it is one of the handful of sessions and lessons I remember from my SOS time over 23 years ago. He said it was an honor to have met you and it's an honor to have you online here with us today. Well, I'll tell him thank you. Well, thank you. And you're old too then. 23. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, Colonel Maskery. He did. So, um, no. And then you have, we have people watching from all over the world, people saying you're, they enjoy, they're enjoying your sense of humor and uh, that you are amazing and Thank you. And people are loving you, sir. <laughs> well, I, th thanks for those nice comments. I, I should, I should print them out and give them to my wife. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was Oscar Wilde who, uh, it was Oscar Wilde who, uh, when asked by somebody, of all people, Oscar Wilde, when asked by, for some personal advice, uh, personal advice before he was to get married, he, uh, Oscar Wilde told him, I uh, just want to let you know that nobody is a hero to his wife or to his valet. They know you really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, but it's nice hearing comments from from people from a long time ago. God bless you. They're loving you. <laughs> wow, sir. Um, it's good to hear that you are a teacher at uh, West Point. Um, I know you will help me let Chief K.O. know who will win the, the matchup this weekend between Army and uh, Air Force. <laughs> oh, there's no <laughs> doubt. There's no doubt how that's going to turn out. Absolutely, sir. He's a, he's in denial, sir. So I, I won't go too hard because I'm 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 going to be partial to my guests. So my guests, we don't, I'm going to let you I'm going to let y'all have that right now. Oh, th thanks, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean no. you're going to say go army chief? Is that what we're that, hearing? That is not, <laughs> that is not that what that's saying. Oh. Hey, that's what I heard too, Julie. He's going to say go army after this. I, hey, how about this? Go army air corps. How about that? I, I'll give you that. <laughs> how much time do we have? I'm going to tell a real quick story. We got. I'm going to tell you a real quick. I'll take a look at the time. I'm going to tell you a real quick story about a Medal of Honor recipient when you mentioned army air corps. So he's gone now, but a guy named Mike Novosel flew B-29s in the second world war. He was really short, like my height. They had to put blocks on the pedals, so otherwise he couldn't fly the plane. Oh, wow. <laughs> he went from being a, you know, an E-0 all the way up to being a colonel at the end of the war. At the end of the war, they busted him down to his permanent grade, which was captain. So he's still flying around, flew every aircraft. 1947, the Army Air Corps becomes the, the, uh, the Air Force. Now he's an Air Force officer during the Korean War. He goes all the way up to Lieutenant Colonel and then he retires. 10 years later, the war in Vietnam starts. So he goes to the Air Force and he says, hey, um, I'd really like to, I wanna come back. I wanna do my bit. Uh, now you're too old. Too old, he said, I've got 600 million hours in every aircraft in the inventory and they said, w w the, Air Force, the Air Force said, no, we can't take you back on active duty. You're retired. You're too old. <laughs> he walks across the street, enlists in the Army, goes to Warren Officer Flight School, becomes a helicopter pilot, and receives the Medal of Honor for action in Vietnam. Oh, wow. 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 Mike <laughs> Novosel. So go Army. And yeah. uh, we'll say, yeah, go Air Army Force. Air Corps, too. I know Air Force lower those ASVAB scores, man. Let, let, let folks see. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so, for having sir, me. So, you have any parting words for our viewers? Yeah, I guess one or two. Uh, for, other than thank you, um, I know people say thank you for your service all the time, and they often they mean it, but they sometimes it's guilt. You know, they feel guilty at not having served. And so it's to make them feel better. That's fine. Um, but I, I was asked one time uh, by uh, some cadets who were about ready to get commissioned and go out and do their bit too. And uh, for some personal advice uh, about being good leaders. And, and I told them the following, you, you can, um, you can take good tips from lots of people. Uh, do it like this sergeant major does. Do it like that lieutenant does. Do it like this guy does, and so on. Um, but you got to incorporate it into yourself. Uh, another quote from um, from Oscar Wilde uh, when somebody asked him the same thing. 
uh, you can't be that person. You can't, you can be like that person by using those techniques, but you can't be that person. He said, be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Yep. I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. Yes, sir. Awesome. That's yeah, no, great words of wisdom. Um, Colonel Jacobs, we really appreciate you. Uh, as you can see, you've impacted so many people that you don't even know that you've impacted. And, and uh, th that's just amazing. And it's always cool to kind of to do something that you did because you love it. And then 20 years later, 30 years later, somebody comes behind and says, man, you, you really impacted my career. And you, you shaped, you shaped uh, leaders, uh, you know, future leaders in, in the in the service. So thank you for that. Thank you for your service. Thank you for sharing your life with us. Uh, this chat means so much to the soldiers, airmen, Space Force personnel. We got a new service. So uh, that stood up, you know, last year, sailors, Marines and Coast Guard members. We appreciate uh, all that you've done and uh, have you de defended this great nation. Well, thank and thanks for what you all are doing now, too. Uh, it's, like I said, Benjamin Franklin said, and we, we can't forget this. We need to hang together or we'll surely hang separately. So let's hang together. And my parting word is uh, go army, beat everybody. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> sir. Amazing. I, I'll let you nice you nice word. I appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Can you, if you can right, hold the chat just a second, uh, I, get, I gotta get some information from you. You bet. Thank you, Chief Chat out. Chat out.